Hello, this is a Reading Junior Classics, Volume 1, Fairy and Wonder Tales. This is Story 1, Manzibo, the Mischief Maker, adapted from H.R. Schoolcraft. There was never in the whole world a more miserable busybody than that of notorious giant Manzibo. He was everywhere, in season and out of season, running about and putting his hand in whatever was going forward. To carry on his game, he could take almost any shape he pleased. He could be very foolish or very wise, very weak or very strong, very rich or very poor, just as happened to suit his humor best. Whatever, whatever anybody else could do, he would attempt without a moment's reflection. He was a match for any man he met and there were a few manitos, good spirits or evil spirits, that could get the better of him. By turns, he would be very kind or cruel, an animal or a bird or a man or a spirit, and yet in spite of all these gifts, Manzibo was always getting himself involved in all sorts of troubles. More than once in the course of his adventures was this great maker of mischief driven to his wit's end to come off with his life. To begin at the beginning, Manzibo, while yet a youngster, was living with his grandmother near the edge of a great prairie. It was on this prairie that he first saw animals and birds of every kind. He also there made first acquaintance with thunder and lightning, he would sit by the hour watching the clouds as they rolled by, musing on the shades of light and darkness as they, as the day rose and fell. For a stripling, Manzibo was uncommonly wide awake. Even sight he beheld in the heavens was a subject of remark. Every new animal or bird an object of deep interest, and every sound was like a new lesson which he was expected to learn. He often trembled at what he heard and saw. The first sound he heard was that of an owl, at which he was greatly terrified, and quickly descending the tree he had climbed, he ran with alarm to the lodge. Noko, Noko, grandmother, he cried, I have heard a mandu. She laughed at his fears and asked him what kind of noise it made. He answered, it makes a noise like this, coo coo, coo coo. His grandmother told him was his grandmother told him he was young and foolish that what he heard was only a bird which derives its name from the particular noise it made. He returned to the prairie and continued his watch as he stood there looking at the clouds. He thought to himself, "It is singular that I am so simple and my grandmother so wise, and that I have never." and I have neither father nor mother. I have never heard a word about them. I must ask and find out. He went home and sat down, silent and dejected, finding that this did not attract the notice of his grandmother. He began a loud lamentation, which he kept increasing louder and louder till it shook the lodge and nearly deafened the old grandmother. Manzibo, what is the matter with you? she said. You are making a great deal of noise. Manzibo started off again with his doleful humble, but succeeded in jerking out between his big sobs, I haven't got any father nor mother, I haven't. Knowing that he was of a wicked and vengeful nature, his grandmother dreaded to tell him the story of his parentage, as she knew he would make trouble of it. Manzibo renewed his cries and managed to throw out for a third or fourth time his sorrowful lament that he was a poor unfortunate who had no parents or relatives. At last she said to him, to quiet him, Yes, you have a father and three brothers living. Your mother is dead. She was taken for a wife by your father, the West, without the consent of her parents. Your brothers are north, east, and south. And being older than you, your father has given them a great power with the winds, according to their names. You are the youngest of his children. 
I have nursed you from your infancy, for your mother died when you were born. I am glad my father is living, said Manzabo. I shall set out in the morning to visit him. His grandmother would have discouraged him, saying it was a long distance to the place where his father, Neglin, or the West lived. This information seemed rather to please than to discourage Manzabo, for by this time he had grown to such a size and strength that he had been compelled to leave the narrow shelters of his grandmother's lodge and live out of doors. He was so tall that if he had been so disposed, he could have snapped off the heads of the birds roosting on the topmost branches of the highest trees as he stood up without being able, without being at the trouble to climb, and if he had at any time taken a fancy to one of the same trees for a walking stick, he would have no more than to do to pluck it up with his thumb and finger and strip down the leaves and twigs with the palm of his hand, bidding good-bye to his grandmother, who pulled a very long face over his departure. Manzibo set out at great pace, for he was able to stride from one side of the prairie to the other in a single step. He found his father on a high mountain far in the west. His father spied the approach at a great distance and bounded down the mountainside several miles to give him welcome. Apparently delighted with each other, they reached in two or three of their giant paces the lodge of the west, which stood high up near the clouds. They spent some days in talking with each other, for these two great persons did nothing on a small scale, and a whole day to deliver a single sentence. Such was the immensity of their discourse, was quite an ordinary affair. One evening Manzibo asked his father what he was most afraid of on earth. He replied, nothing. But is there nothing you dread here, nothing that would hurt you if you took too much of it? Come, tell me. Manzibo was very urgent. So at last his father said, yes, there is a black stone to be found a couple of hundred miles from here, over that way, pointing as he spoke, it is the only thing on earth I am afraid of, for it should happen to hit me on any part of my body would hurt me very much. The West made this important circumstance known to Manzibo in the strictest confidence. Now you will not tell anyone, Manzibo, that the black stone is bad medicine for your father, will you? He added, you are a good son, and I know you will keep it to yourself. Now tell me, my darling boy, is there not, is there not, not something that you don't like? Manzibo answered promptly, nothing. His father, who was of steady and persevering nature, put the same question to him seventeen times, each time Manzibo made the same answer, nothing, but the West insisted, there must be something you're afraid of. Well, I will tell you, said Manzibo, what it is. He made an effort to speak, but it seemed to be too much for him. Out with it, said the West, fetching Manzibo, such a blow on the back as shook the mountain with its echo. Gee, 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 it is, said Manzibo, apparently in great pain. Yes, yes, I cannot name it. I tremble so. The West told him to banish his fears and to speak up. No one would hurt him. Manzibo began again, and he would never have gone over the same make-believe make believe of pain had not his father, whose strength he knew was more than a match for his own, threatened to pitch him over into a river about five miles off. At last he cried out, Father, since you will know, it is the root of the bulrush. He who could with perfect ease spin a spindle of a whole day long seemed to be exhausted by the effort of pronouncing that word, bulrush. Some time after Menzibo observed, I will get some of the black rock merely to see how it looks. Well, said the father, I will also get a little bit of the bulrush root to learn how it tastes. They were both double-dealing with each other, and in their hearts getting ready for some desperate work, they had no sooner separated for the evening than Manzibo was riding off 
the couple hundred miles necessary to bring him to the place where the black rock was to be procured, while down the other side of the mountain hurried Nimbrin the west. At the break of day they each appeared at great level on the top mountain, Manzibo with twenty loads at least of the black stone on one side, and on the other side with whole meadow of bulbrush in his arms. Manzibo was the first to strike, hurling a great piece of the black rock which struck the west directly between the eyes. He returned the favor with a blow of bulrush that rung over the shoulders of Manzibo far and wide, like a long lash of lightning among the clouds. First one, then the other, Manzibo poured, poured in a tempest of black rocks, while the west discharged a shower of bulrush, blow upon blow, thwack upon thwack. They fought hand to hand until black rock and bulrush were all gone. Then they betook themselves to hurling crags at each other, cudgeling with huge oak trees, and defining each other from one mountain top to another. Well, at times they shot enormous boulders of granite across at each other's heads as though they had been mere jackstones. The battle which had commenced on the mountains had extended far west. The west was forced to give ground. Manzibo, pressing on, drove him across rivers and mountains, ridges and lakes, till at last he got him to the very brink of the world. Hold, cried the West, my son, you know my power, and although I allow I am now fairly out of breath, it is impossible to kill me. Stop where you are, and I will also portion you out with as much power as your brothers. The four quarters of the globe are already occupied, but you can go and do a great deal good to the people of earth, which is beset with serpents, beasts, and monsters. You make a great havoc of human life. Go and do good, and if you put forth half the strength you have today, you will acquire a name that will last forever. When you have finished your work, I will have a place provided for you. You will then go and sit with your brother, Kabinduka, in the north. Manzibo gave his father his hand upon this agreement, and parting from him, he returned to his own grounds, where he lay for some time sore of his wounds.